All right, here we go. Robert Lundberg Show live and direct right to you from YouTube, from my basement to you. Anyhow, I'm tired today. I got to tell you, I got to tell you, like going to work um, under the current circumstances I'm going to work in, uh, trying to do everything else I'm trying to do at the same time, and then showing up here in the evenings. Actually, once we get going, um, it's really the coolest thing in the world. It's the coolest thing in the world that so many of you are here and, and interacting. And like I said, you're the program directors. You'll help me out. You'll help me improve this. You'll help me find its identity as we go forward. If you want to help out, hit me up, shoot me a line. You know, I'm, I'm not out there begging for help because I don't really, you know, like I don't got the capital to be throwing it y'all's way. But <laughs> any suggestions, feedbacks, tips, I'll take them. I appreciate all you guys interacting on a day-to-day -day basis here with the show. Monday through Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern time is the, the current broadcasting plans. In fact, I'm so dedicated to that. This is my dedication level. I'm so dedicated to that that my assistant coach for the rec basketball team is coaching the practice tonight. Because I set this um set this time frame last week because I was like, I need to, I need to be consistent. I need to be consistent. And I, I need to put out there a schedule for myself. Or else I won't, you know, I'll, I'll say, oh, I'll do it this day. I won't do it this other day. Like, I'm working on this book right now, or I was, and I put that down for a second with everything else I'm doing. It's sort of like a memoir slash um, motivational book. Um, the only notable person from Lusby was the working title, because I'm, I'm t technically on Wikipedia, the only notable person from my hometown. There's the, the prime. Have I told the prime story on here yet? My son loves it. It matches the bubble. Wait, no, orientation, sorry. Matches the bubble down there because I remember being at the, the pool and the ice cream man came by and all the kids were like, we got prom, boys, we got prom. I'm like, why are they so obsessed with this thing? I looked at the back and it's like, it's fine. Uh, you can have it. And then Chuck Schumer and all of them were like, this, uh, you know, th this is um, going to kill the kids. And I was like, what are they talking about? And I realized there's a big difference uh, <laughs> between the energy drink and the hydration drink. Uh, N.A. says drinking, he meant to say that, seems hard. Yeah. Um, it, look, it's refreshing. I Shouts to Logan Paul for, for the prime drink. Anyhow, um, but I, I put the schedule out there, and I'm dedicated enough that I have my, um, my assistant, co-head coach, I guess I should call him now, uh, helping out tonight. M my son Raj is, is playing over there. They had a later practice than we usually have, and I, I didn't look at it on the schedule. So here I am with you. And we're going to start tonight talking about Deadpool 3 possibly saving the Marvel Universe. Why would I talk about this today? Well, I, I saw this earlier and I was looking for a, a topic to lead with. And we haven't really hit the Marvel stuff here as of yet. And when I was uh, on, um, I was still calling it Twitter earlier, I saw this note from director Matthew Vaughn. He says, Deadpool 3 will save the Marvel Universe. The snippets that I know are unbelievable. Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman are about to save the whole Marvel Universe. And to be honest, I believe it. I believe it. You know, the MCU has certainly struggled post-Endgame. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I mean, what they did in putting that together is still one of the most impressive feats, if not the most impressive feat in the history of cinema. I mean, going into Iron Man, the first Iron Man, you got to remember, Iron Man was um, not uh, the A character. He was never the A character. I always thought he would be a better movie character than he was a comic book character. And he was cool in like the team up stories and whatnot, but he wasn't like the money character until the MCU started. And the casting of um, Robert Downey Jr. was amazing in that regard. It was amazing in that regard. And then they they teased the Avengers and the end credits. And I was so pumped. But even I didn't realize how they would build it block by block by block and connect all that. Because that had never really been done in movies before. You know, the continuity like the comic books have. Where all the individual comics lead up to the big crossover event. And it, it was amazing that they were able to do it and, and string it along. And, and I think the, the thing that credits that the most, I think the thing that 
shows you just how successful was that that was was Guardians of the freaking Galaxy. I was a comic book nerd growing up. I used to I lived on the bottom of a hill called Marina Overlook. Uh, Marina Overlook was the street. It was a straight downhill. Like there was a German Shepherd that lived in the middle. I used to pedal my bike so fast to get by him, you know, because he'd be like, ah! he scared the shit out of me. I'm, I'm still scared of dogs. That's my my phobia. But I would walk up that hill, which wasn't paved, to the mailbox. Our mailbox was at the top to get Wizard Magazine. And if you remember Wizard Magazine, in there, they had a um a section, like a casting call section, where they would cast movies, comic book movies. I remember Patrick Stewart was Professor X in Wizard Magazine before Patrick Stewart was Professor X in X-Men. And Blade deserves some credit for helping lay the groundwork. And then X-Men and the, the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies. But it wasn't until the MCU that it picked up the way it did. And I say that all because Guardians of the Galaxy, I barely knew who they were. And that was a box office smash. And it's now an institution. It was It's an institution. Ben Ratner is sending some chats in. The first one, Deadpool, more like Olivia Ocean. I don't even understand that comment. Uh, and then he says, who would win in a fight? Happy Hogan or, or Hulk Hogan? I mean, come on. The Hulkster is, is doing the, the finger wag and, until Iron Man comes in and helps Happy. But nonetheless, the Marvel Universe took off and they made the Avengers the A team. The Avengers were never the A team, they were the B team in the comics to the X Men. But Marvel didn't have the property for that. They didn't have they didn't own it for the movies. JB Homani says happy for sure. We're talking about John Favreau, right? <laughs> From Iron Man. Isn't that happy okay? <laughs> I don't know if he's he's withstanding the big boot and the leg drop. Sorry, guys. But um, you know, when they cut the deal, when Marvel went bankrupt back in the I, I think it was the 80s, maybe the late 80s, they sold off the movie rights to these other companies. Fox had X-Men, Sony had Spider-Man. And those are the two most popular properties. They finally cut the deal with Sony. That's why Spider-Man showed up in Captain America Civil War. That was his first appearance in the MCU. They cut the deal with Sony. And then eventually Disney bought all those Fox properties back, so they finally have control of the X-Men. But because they didn't have those properties, they had to start with um, the other ones. And that was why it was so huge that they turned Iron Man into a freaking star. And Captain America into a freaking star. And eventually built and built and built till you got to the Infinity Saga and Thanos. And I, I will argue that Infinity War, Avengers Infinity War is the greatest movie ever made. I honestly believe that. It's the best movie ever made. And... You know, I, I, just the way I felt leaving that theater with the snap and the, I don't want to go, Mr. Stark. I don't want to go. Yo, I couldn't wait. I was like running out like, what's the next one? And then Endgame, Endgame gives you that moment, you know, with the freaking hammer. Fuck, man. It's amazing. Ray Ray says, I love Marvel movies. I think they suck at TV, Robin. Well... I'm sort of getting there. So when you have this unbelievably well-executed plan, this unbelievably well-executed plan, and then it reaches its completion, where do you go from there? And they were so successful, they just wanted to, I think, saturate the market, saturate the market, and get people into Disney+, Plus, get those subscribers into Disney+. Plus. But... It didn't really work out like that. And they've kind of felt directionless since then. I mean, if we're being real about it, they've definitely felt directionless since then. But they do have that X-Men card in the back pocket. And I don't care what nobody says. X-Men is the greatest comic book property of all time. If Spider-Man's the greatest superhero of all time, I have to relent. You know, that behind me right there, I was always a Wolverine and Hulk guy growing up. That's Incredible Hulk number 181. 
That's like the actual comic. First appearance of Wolverine. So if you ever see this up there, that's why it's Wolverine and it's Hulk next to each other. Because it was in Incredible Hulk number 181, first appearance of Wolverine. I always um, always was Wolverine the Hulk guy growing up. Um, and, you know, and Wolverine, before Iron Man became what he was, Wolverine was the, the other popular character next to Spider-Man. But over time, I, I've grown to know that Spider-Man is objectively the best superhero. Objectively the best superhero. Because he's relatable. He, um, you know, his action looks freaking cool. His suit is sick. You know, and the quips. Yeah, I never liked the... Uh, I wasn't a big Tobey Maguire Spider-Man fan because he never did the, the quip thing. I actually, I mean, I think the new kid, uh, what's his name? I thought Garfield did a good job and Tom Holland. Uh, you know, I think he's really good. And wait till they introduce Miles Morales. I mean, those animated Spider-Verse movies were, were great. But the X-Men were always the best property with the best stories. That's why we all dug the X-Men animated series. Da -da 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 -da. That's why X-Men number one is still the best-selling comic book of all time. Back. I think I got that right here. Yeah. X-Men number one, signed by Jim Lee, the greatest artist of all time. I mean, just like, look at some of these. I think it's a pull-out cover. Yeah. The whole cover on this joint pulls out. Jim Lee is the greatest artist ever. His work on X-Men is the best art I've ever seen in my life. No joke. Better than the Mona Lisa. All that. Magneto, what a great character he is. So, I mean, that was what I was the... I always loved the Beast, too. I know he made that appearance in, um, what you call it, the Captain Marvel movie. I haven't even seen that yet. Um, that shows you, you know, I was like, I had to see every Marvel movie the second it came out. And I haven't even seen one of the, the latest ones, the Captain, Captain Marvel joint. Uh, but, you know, the X-Men coming is a big deal. Token Hour podcast. Need more X-Men for sure. Wolverine is my fave. Yeah, I mean, Wolverine, Hugh Jackman did a great job. I think they eventually need to recast him. I do. Um, oh, no. That's a bad joke, Ben. This was the one I was looking for. WandaVision and Loki were awesome. She-Hulk was a lot of fun. And what if is fascinating. I'm Team Marvel TV. I, I loved WandaVision. I thought Loki was boring. Really, really boring. But I, I loved WandaVision. Um, that's the best thing. The best things that they've done post Endgame to me are the the most the, the Spider Man, obviously that everybody loved, and that was like a moment really saved movies. Um, the Black Panther sequel I liked. I liked Multiverse of Madness. I kind of rocked with it because of Wanda and WandaVision. Those are the ones, but. When Matthew Vaughn, the director, is saying that Deadpool 3 is going to save Marvel, I think you have to take that seriously. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with him, I think he directed X-Men First Class, which has that sick-ass scene with Magneto in the bar. I love that scene. Uh, he directed Kick-Ass, I believe. Directed Kick-Ass. So he knows what he's doing. De Peso says Guardians 3 was fire. A lot of people like Guardians 3 too. Um, you know, that that seems to be one of the more well-received ones since, since Endgame. But I do believe that Deadpool 3 is going to save Marvel. I, I think that Deadpool 3 will be the biggest movie of the year. No question. No question. It's going to be, um, I believe, at the Super Bowl. They're going to premiere the, the trailer. I think that's the, that's the plan. Let's see. Uh, Right here, yeah. Deadpool 3, first trailer currently being prepared, expected to debut during the Super Bowl. And Ryan Reynolds has done a good job with the with the Deadpool character. Uh, I didn't really like Deadpool 2 at all. Uh, Deadpool 1 was good. I, I didn't love it as much as everybody else, but I thought he did um, a good job. I do think he does a good job with that character. And Hugh Jackman, there's a, a bit of nostalgia. And that's what that's what Deadpool 3 is going to have. It's going to have nostalgia, and it's going to look forward. The nostalgia of all those Fox X-Men tie-ins, I think they're going to kill the entire Marvel Universe. Aaron Marcus says he concurs regarding Deadpool 3 saving the Marvel Universe. 
And I think it will also set the tone for where they go from here and really hard reboot in the sense of allowing that multiverse, the walls to really be broken down because you'll see all these people show up and and be killed off or or what have you. And then, okay, the X-Men are actually here now. And whatever the new version of Wolverine looks like. I mean, how about Wolverine and Hulk? Just like, God damn it. I can't do it. How about, how, do I, how am I going to learn this? Wolverine and Hulk. How about that? Like 181. And recreating it. I mean, that's going to be sick on screen. I, I mentioned World War Hulk on one of these streams. What about that? Bringing that to the, you know, equation. So... You can't sleep on the X-Men and what they're going to mean. D pays us, will it save it by resetting some things back to scratch or just course correct the universe? Look, I, I think the problem is that the stories are done with Cap and Iron Man and those characters. And the hard truth is the new characters aren't as good. Some of them are fine, but you can't build the team around some of these kind of scrubs. Or characters that people aren't feeling as much. So you have to bring in the heavy hitters. And that means Spider-Man, who obviously they're going to have to put the, the keys to the franchise in his hands. And Wolverine and the X-Men. But there's so many stories to be told with the X-Men that they could almost make the MCU into the X-Men U going forward. And use that as the jumping off point and really the basis for everything. Sort of, you know, because you can't, they already took the B characters and made them A characters. It's going to be tough to make the C and D characters B and A characters. That's going to be tough to recreate that magic. But I'm looking forward to Deadpool 3. And I think you got to take what Matthew Vaughn said seriously there. And I, I think um, it will say more because it's going to be a monster movie. And it's going to show that when it really, when the chips are on the table, no movies are bigger than Marvel movies. You know, that Spider-Man movie saved the movies after COVID. Infinity War and Endgame are the biggest events we can ever recall in the movies. And I think Deadpool 3 is going to be the biggest event movie since that Spider-Man movie. So for all of the anticlimactic stuff between, that gets made up. <laughs> Robin sipping that Logan juice. No, I, yo, I don't even drink. I'll tell that story. On one of these shows, maybe, maybe one time this week, I, I got to get to that. So, you know, cause I, I'm going to keep it real with you. Uh, I had a, um, a, a guy who I used to work with. Let me make sure I pronounce his name. Right. Uh, and if he's watching mad respect, but he, he does like YouTube marketing, Dave Kropinski. And he had hit me up and, and he also like said, you know, he had imagined some stuff with the RL, you know, like Robin Lundberg real, you know, all the words R and L. Um, and, so I'm going to keep it real with y'all. So I'll tell you my personal stories and the like, but no alcohol in this uh, Logan Paul juice. Aaron Marcus, World War Hulk. How about Planet Hulk first? Um, yeah, I mean, Planet, if you don't know, Hulk was sent into space by the Illuminati, by Iron Man and Mr. Fantastic and Doctor Strange. And I, I forget the, the entire makeup of that crew. But they basically determined he was too much of a danger. Mr. Fantastic, too much of a danger. By the way, they're getting the Fantastic Four back as well. Too much of a danger to um, the world, essentially. So they sent him up to this other planet. He fell in love and whatnot. And the, the rocket ship he was on was set to self-destruct. And it killed his wife. And he was really pissed off. And he came back and, and beat all their asses. <laughs> so in Madison Square Garden, one of the coolest collection of stories ever. Um the, the World War Hulk in my mind. Aaron Marcus says it was Submariner. So it was Namor, uh, who was the other member of the Illuminati who you were introduced to in Black Panther 2. So yeah, definitely looking forward to Deadpool 3. I uh, want to get into a, a few other things uh, here on the show today, including, um, I don't know if you saw this, the Sabrina Ionescu, Steph Curry thing about the, the three-point shootout. And I just want to give a little respect to Sabrina. I want to give a little respect to Sabrina because this was about set to get hated on. People were about set to hate on it because they um, put out that they were going to go against each other in a three-point shootout. 
And the rules were that she'd be shooting from WNBA three and he'd be shooting from NBA three. And the, the problem with that is it's not equal. You want the competition to be equal. It's got to be equal. And, and here's one of the things that we run into in, in modern day society where you get punished for stating like scientific truth and facts. You know, like there are, like there are biological differences between men and women. Scientific fact does not make men superior to women, does not make women inferior to men. There are, you know, various things that are just different about the composition of our bodies. I mean, I, my daughter, Ronnie, is the best person in the world. The most competitive, most competitive girl you'll ever see. So I'm never doubting the competitiveness or the skills or any of that. But if you're going to say who's the better three-point shooter, well, one shouldn't be closer than the other. Or else it's not a, the, a real competition. A fair competition, I guess you will. But, you know, I'm going to credit Sabrina because she came with it. She saw that that was going to be what people were saying. And she was like, I'll shoot from the NBA line. Let's get it. So whether that happens or not, ultimate respect to Sabrina Unescu for volunteering that and putting that out there. Because that would be real money. I mean, she, I mean, Steph would never recover from that. No, Steph is awesome. Steph is awesome. But the, I mean, the WNBA ladies are bad, no question. So skilled. And I can't wait to see what like Caitlin Clark does when she gets there. You know, um, so I thought that was a cool little story. I, I, I don't know, you know, how much attention it's actually going to draw, how good it'll actually be, but it's a, a nice little quirk. And, and I love the fact that Sabrina put that, whether or not she shoots from WNBA range or not, the, the fact that she put that out there in the universe, I thought was very, very cool. Uh, another basketball story, Ben Simmons was back last night. I don't know if you guys saw that. Ben is basically more of a hypothetical player than a, um, a real player at this point in time. But he looked really good. And if you're a Nets fan, it's hard not to convince yourself that he can make a big difference for the team if he's actually available. That's the issue. You know, Ben has not been available much. I mean, last year he didn't play well whether he was available or not. This year, when he's been on the court, he's been pretty good. And last night, he was borderline dominant during the time that he was on the floor. In, in 18 minutes, 10 points, 11 assists, 8 rebounds. Extrapolate that over 36 minutes. That's 20 points, 16 boards, 22 assists. I mean, he, he provided a physical presence for that team that they really needed. He picked up the pace for that team. He set up the other guys. You know, Mikael Bridges has been asked to do too much. He's been asked to do too much. And instead, you know, Ben got things moving for him. Well, if he's able to stay on the floor, I think that does make a difference for the Nets. I mean, I, I know you guys like hear me talk New York basketball. I don't know if I mentioned um, Julius Randle and the injury on this show that the Knicks are dealing with that. That's just a bummer. Such a good season for the Knicks. And then Randle has that shoulder injury. You got to hope there wasn't significant damage to the ligaments or anything like that. Um, and he'll be back within a month or so, roughly. You know, a month or so, I would guess, is the optimistic timeline for Randall. D. Pesos, imaginary player who provided a physical presence, huh? That's uh, Ben Simmons. Imaginary player, all-time great Jay-Z song. Imaginary player. What's the difference between a 4.0 and a 4.6? About 30, 40 grand. No. Well, I can curse, right? Well, I, 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 certain things I, you know, just in case. But, you know, I got to let it. I'll, I'll start breaking that down. I think I've cursed a few times on this stream already. I'll start breaking those walls down as I keep going. Wu says, Robin, be honest about the Brooklyn rebrand. They need to go to Seattle, bro. I disagree. The Brooklyn Nets rebuild has, rebrand has been very successful. I mean, we, I talked about the Kevin Durant tribute video yesterday. I think what KD really did was legitimize the franchise. And I've seen 
a um I've seen a sort of building of that fan base in the years that that I've been over there. You know, game seven against the Bucks, one of the maybe the best game I've ever been to in person and a, and a great sporting event. And, you know, after that, um, it never got to that, that height again, but the Barclays is filled up every night. I mean, and any team that goes through what the Nets are going through right now is going to have less attention, less, less interest. But did you hear them cheering for Ben last night? I mean, that shows you one thing about the, the current state of the Nets. But the Barclays was 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 cheering for the dude. And I think that, you know, you could just see the energy he brought to the team. So uh, Knicks fans are always, you know, here's the thing. The Knicks are doing really well. I got nothing bad to say about the Knicks. I think the Knicks, if fully healthy with one more move, you know, to get some punch off the bench, are like a championship contender or at least a team that can flirt with being in the finals. Not without Randall, obviously. Not if, you know, if they're injured. But I got nothing bad to say about the Knicks right now. But a lot of Knicks fans are mad obsessed with the Nets. They're obsessed with them. Like, and in, in, in talking about their fans and how they don't have fans and, and all this. If, if, the, if that matters to you so much, why do you always talk about it? If they don't have fans, there's nobody to talk to. You know? Who, who are you talking to if they don't have fans? You're talking to somebody. So I, I, I don't know why. I, maybe it was because the 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 Nets actually garnered all the attention for a little bit there in New York and outside. Well, not, not never in New York. I'll say that you know, but outside of New York, the Nets were the number one story in New York basketball. So, you know, you guys gotta gotta let that go. Gotta let that go. Gotta shake it off. That's one other thing I wanted to bring up today because I tweeted this out earlier. Uh, Taylor Swift. And I know everybody's sick and tired of hearing about Taylor Swift. I don't even talk about Taylor Swift much myself. I'm, I'm hardly a, a Taylor Swift expert, but I did tweet out earlier that uh, she has some good songs. However, Shake It Off is not one of them. And my daughter was mad at me when I told her on the way home. I just, right before I started the stream, I picked her up from her, her class and I, I told her that. And I, I really think that song sucks. I really, really do think that song sucks. I, I, I don't know if, do, am I wrong in that? Is Shake It Off a good song? Shake It Off a good song? What do you guys think? Let me know. Because I, I like Taylor's folklore record a lot. That's the thing that won me over. It had some soul. You know, it kind of, you know, didn't have the same vibe as Fleetwood Mac. But if you're um, if you're telling me to pick my, here's a little insight into my musical tastes. Um, for those of you who don't know, I think most of you know I'm a big hip hop head. Uh, but if you were to like, tell me I could pick five artists and they're the only ones I could listen to for the rest of time. It'd be Hove. It'd be Wu-Tang Clan. And, and all the stuff that comes under that umbrella. Outcast. And then I take Fleetwood Mac and Tom Petty. Because their, their good songs are forever songs. Like you can just play them on a loop, on a loop. And I think that Taylor Swift folklore record had a little bit of that soul. Had a little bit of that soul. So I, I gained respect to her for her um, from that. You know, the other, you know, candidate, I'm a big Neptune's Pharrell fan. Uh, Kanye, just hard uh, with Kanye. He certainly would have been in contention for that. Um, Wu says, would love a Ruko and Lundberg Knicks Nets podcast. I'll get Ruko on this show um, 100%. You know, he texts me about the Nets all the time. We text back and forth. And Wu also says, Robin, rank the nine Wu members in your order. Okay, uh, I can do that. RZA is number one. Definitely. You know, in, in some of these, um, like the documentary and the Hulu series and everything, it just gives you a renewed appreciation for the fact that RZA was clearly the architect of the whole thing. You know, uh, and the music. He did all the music. One of the greatest producers of all time on my Mount Rushmore of producers. I mean, 
fourth chamber off Jizza's debut. Only a maniacal individual could create that beat. Like, or reunited, it's woo. Come on. It's so hard. Um, but so Riz is number one. Method Man's number two. Because without Method Man, oh, by the way, uh, Aaron Marcus says that cursing messes with monetization. So I'll, I'll try and keep my, uh, try and censor myself like I'm on the actual radio or any other broadcast. You know, I'll, I'll try and, and do that. But uh, Method Man is, is definitely number two because without him and his charisma and his delivery and all that, I don't think Wu ever pops off. Um, well, he says in your order, but I'm doing the, this is the objective order. I can tell, I'll, I'll like give you my personal preferences as I um, go through, but I think you've got to go RZA, Meth, then it's got to be ODB. And there's a reason those were the ones, like R RZA did the, the beat. Meth was the first star, ODB was the next star. ODB had that certain sort of flavor. Then it's Ghost. I mean, you have, a, and Jizza and Ray. Clearly, I mean, you can mix up that order. I, I would say Liquid Swords is actually my favorite Wu solo album. Uh, I would say that Ghost has the best solo catalog. Um, Ray obviously has to be in that mix, but I would go Riza, Meth, ODB, Ghost, Jizza, Raekwon, and then the rest you can just kind of put in whatever order you want. Uh, personally, I'd go. Riza meth ghost or Riza ghost meth. Meth doesn't have a classic solo album. That's what hurts him. But you know, that's what was I talking about? Taylor? I'm done with Taylor Swift. I'm not, I'm not going back to that. Uh, Mr. AZ says Nets versus Suns tomorrow. I'm aware. Uh, I'm aware. You look, the, the Nets and the Suns, there'll be a, I did a little video. Um, I, I did a little video about uh, how the Nets won the trade. I think it was on the first show here. Somebody yelled at me about that. It was the first or second show. And and I um, I didn't realize how strong Suns Nation is because I've never been dunked on by a fan base more than Suns fans. Between that uh, little take I did this year, which kind of blew up, and back when I was doing SI Now in studio, I did a segment on Devin Booker. And they killed me with the lower third. I, I think it was an intern or something wrote the lower third. It says, is Devin Booker even good or actually good? It's just like a horrible lower third, which made my comments seem 10 times worse and made me very memeable because of the, the screenshot with that lower third. Um, my, you know, it was still a bad take. I, I still was, you know, I, I, I land somewhere between that take and Devin Booker's, you know, a top five player. Like he's a really good player, um, but he's certainly better than just the bench score, the Lou Williams type of guy, um, you know, that that I, I got crushed for. But the Suns fans always come after me. And and I still think the Nets did very well in that trade because the Suns are basically hard capped in their situation going forward. So those Suns draft picks could be really, really good. KD's not a young guy. And McHale is a bona fide stud. So just because the Nets went through a, a, a little bit of a struggle doesn't mean – that, that trade was better. Look, anytime you blow up what they blew up, you're going to, you know, have to deal with some warts. You're going to have to deal with some warts. Craig Gringhold says, hope you have Anthony Pierno on the podcast. If you're still in touch, he'd add to the Marvel conversation. Yeah, Anthony was my producer on CBS Sports Radio Saturday mornings. Great dude. Um, yeah, we're still, we still text every now and again. So I, I, I'm, I am mo almost certain. Uh, you know, I could um, get him on the show <laughs> with a text, and I can add that. Wu says, if it wasn't for the Wu-Tang Clan, I'd have no idea who Robin is. That's what RZA did. Now, I don't understand that comment exactly, but you want to see something cool? This is the coolest number in my phone. Now, I can't promise to you that it is um, still active and still the correct number, and I got to make sure I pull it down so you don't actually see the number. But oh, hold on, how do I do this? Oh, I'll just cover it with my finger. Um, wait a second, what did I do? Yeah. 
All right. Razor. Coolest number in my phone. The day that I got to put that in my phone, you know. Um, I'm not going to like prank call the Abbott or anything like that, though. <laughs> but maybe, maybe if I get back into my rapping days, I could get him to, to cut me some. That was a decent, I could still, I could still, you know, spill a little bit if I, if I wanted to. No question. No question. Uh, last thing I had on the, the rundown, and I'll, I'll still take your guys' comments. Um, anything you want to hear from me, any suggestions you have for the show, uh, that's always, you know, that's the, the biggest reason I'm doing this is live is, is so I could talk to you. In fact, I don't know if this would work in this format if I wasn't doing it. I, I don't think it would um, because, I, you know, your interaction is such a big part of the show. But I thought this was funny. I, I don't know if you guys saw it. Like Elmo sent out like a message earlier today basically saying, how's everybody doing? And they were like, you're we're, we're having problems with our mental health and everything. <laughs> Poor Elmo. <laughs> you know, just, you know, the Sesame Street guy. The, the character, the friend, friendly Elmo, <laughs> just out there getting roasted by everybody. <laughs> it's the hashtag emotional well-being. I have a, a soft spot for Elmo because, you know, if you have kids, all those kids go through certain phase and, and they usually have a, a Sesame Street phase where they, you know, they're, they're really into Sesame Street. And I've got a little bit I do with the kids where it's like, oh, boy, it's me, Mickey Mouse. And with just a slight change of octave, I'm Elmo. Mickey Mouse, Elmo. Not bad, right? Not bad. But poor Elmo. He finds out what the internet is like. The internet is not real life. Internet is not real life. Uh, <laughs> he says, explain how that got in your phone, Riza. He was promoting a movie back when I was doing Max Kellerman's show. Uh, and he was a guest on the show. And in order to get him on the show, he gave us the phone number. I don't know if it's still the the, the number. Uh, Aaron Marcus says, got to cut out early tonight, bro. Peace. Look, thank you for joining. You're not cutting out early. You're here for any part of the show. I really do appreciate that. I really do appreciate that. You know, and, and the, these, these streams have been hitting about, I feel like, 40 minutes, 40-something minutes on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, that That's about where they've been landing. Uh, you know, and that I go till it feels feels done. So I've I've hit all the topics I had in the in the rundown. If you just tuned in, I, I started with um, Deadpool three to save Marvel. Uh, the director Matthew Vaughn said Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman are going to save Marvel. I agree that that's going to be the biggest movie of the year. Uh, Wolverine, you know, being back. Obviously, the X Men being introduced. It's going to pull on nostalgia and set up the, the future. But I, I've been through the, the rundown and the, the stuff that I had. Um, so everything else is, is up to you guys. If there's anything, you know, I'm going to work on, I'm going to obviously continue to, to spruce up the presentation here, uh, you know, build out this studio a little bit, um, you know, learn the back end of the, the software and everything and, and continue to, to get better in that regard. Like I said, this show is going to find its identity. Over time, I mean, it's already, you know, building, ho hopefully, and, and you guys are enjoying it, but everything evolves over time. Somebody told me um, perfection uh, prevents progress. So that, that was another reason that justified me just going and, and getting this show rolling off the, off the ground. I'm also going to integrate guests, of course, into the show. Um, some of my friends and contacts in the industry just because it'll spice up the conversation, make it easier for me to do. I'm, I'm hoping to get, I, I don't want to blow up the spot, but I, I texted Peter Rosenberg to see if he'd be the first guest on the show because he actually reached out to me and uh, when, when this went down and I started and, you know, was very complimentary uh, on it and, and said he, you know, would come on. So uh, I, I, I was hoping maybe he'd be the first guest on the show, but uh, obviously Ryan Rucco and, and, Max and everybody else who I've, you know, uh, interacted with throughout my, my career, uh, I could have on maybe some of my actual friends, like, out, I mean, these guys are my friends, but you know, my friends outside of, uh, work, uh, family members, you know, uh, we'll see, we'll see how it evolves. Um, you know, uh, I can also do like 
the cold reach outs to see if people you guys would want to see would be on the show. Maybe I'll hit up RZA. Maybe I hit up, hit up RZA. <laughs> that would be the real win if I could get him. The RZA, the razor, hit me with the flavor, the damage, the pain, the understand it, behavior. Is that right? I think so. I think so. I mean, I, I, I could rap those songs for you. I could, you know, I used to do a lot of freestyle rap battling in my day. In fact, uptown in New York, I went by Robbie B. Uh, Ernesto Luciano. We've got the Facebook's comments coming in now, too. Says me. He wants to be the first guest. You can be a guest. I think, Ernesto, were you on uh, Fanalist Fridays on ESPN New York? I did a bit where... I would bring a fan in to co-host with me every Friday. I think Ernesto was one of the, the guests on that. Good dude. Um, what was I saying? Oh, so yeah, when I lived uptown, when I first moved there, everybody went by their names growing up. It was like, uh, it was Justice-ish, Power, Boo, R.I.P. Boo. Um, and me, and, and like one of my first nights there, I like burned down the neighborhood weed dealer in a freestyle battle. And from then on, I was known as Robbie B. I'm, I'm not sure how that came to be other than that little story there. But uh, I was Robbie B. Supreme clientele or Iron Man? Supreme clientele. Yeah, Ghost found his voice more on Supreme clientele. You know, Iron Man was more reliant on the, um, the that opening production from a... From, uh, Rizza and what he did. I mean, what Rizza did is incredible. The fact that he did first album, most of the second album, all their solo albums. Dave Pezo says, Jerky Wolverine can be fun on screen. If we get 100 viewers at one time, Rizza cold text sounds fun. Who is Jerky Wolverine? You're going to have to explain that one to me. I don't quite get that. Ernesto says, don't forget stick to sports. Yes, yeah, stick to sports. I did with the video call center. Um, a lot of you guys... You know, it, again, that's so cool to see uh, so many of you guys circle back once I started doing this, you know, uh, because that's one thing that was missing from the all the video content I've been doing is you get the comments out, out there, you know, Instagram comments and stuff are mean, but you get the comments, but you don't have that real time interaction. I, I don't think you have that real time connection that I've been able to get here and, and look at the, all the comments. That are coming through from from YouTube, from Facebook, from X, if you will. I mean, it, that is awesome, guys. It really is. Um, it, it's uh, one of the coolest things in the world. Ernesto says, "Tell them what's Jay Z's best album." Four forty four is Jay Z's best album. I really believe that. Uh, I think it's a classic. Every song on it is great. It's like adult contemporary rap in a sense, but done really well. Um, having a new perspective, 13 albums in. To me, it's it's 444, Blueprint. Black Album? Even though Black Album doesn't really feel like an album as much as a collection of songs. Reasonable Doubt. Vol I love Volume 1. In some ways, I like Volume 1 more than I like Reasonable Doubt, if I'm being real. Other than The Missteps and American Gangster. Those are the, the top joints for me. Best beat on Liquid Swords. Oh, uh, no, it's um, either Shadow Boxing or Fourth Chamber. Shadow Boxing or Fourth Chamber. No doubt about it. So I see that the hip-hop stuff is going to um, generate a lot of interaction here. I'll, I'll frame one of these upcoming episodes around a hip hop, um, hip hop topic, you know, I'll definitely do that. But yeah, again, guys, uh, Monday through Thursday, 8 PM Eastern time. Let me know what I can do better, what you like, what you'd like to see more of, um, any of that stuff. And, and I appreciate you guys hanging out with me here on a night in and night out basis. I'll be back tomorrow. Same Robin time and same Robin channel.